This is the tale of Meredith, her incredibly painful life circumstances and her tragic end. Meredith came from a troubled family enduring a very hard childhood. Her father, Tim Maynard, an alcoholic, had abandoned her mother Sally to raise the children alone. That's when she met with Stuart Pierce and after a short romance, they got married in Meredith's hometown of Mount Gambier in 1977, where they were blessed with four beautiful kids. Stuart Pierce is a bizarre figure with everyone who knew him sharing different opinions about him. His neighbor George Dobbin commented, He was a hard worker, often seen doing odd jobs for the neighbors. We'd share a few beers, and he never seemed to lose control. Another neighbor mentioned he was active in the local Boy Scouts, taking them on camping trips. He excelled in the wild and even taught my son survival tips, a self-sufficient man who relied on nature. He was good with the kids, not just his own, he added. When I witnessed him with his children, he appeared as a loving, proud father. On the other side, another neighbor recalled, one day he would be in high spirits, enjoying his meal and chatting with the kids about their day. Other times, he'd stumble into the dining room, hardly saying a word. If displeased with the meal, he'd either throw it at his terrified wife or smash his plate against the wall. Stuart Pierce was lively and joyful when sober, but a man with a violent and vicious temper after a few drinks. Meredith's elder sister, Lorraine Hasty, aged 50, shared, Stuart had a superego personality, always wanted the best, feeling he deserved it, constantly boasting and trying to impress, but all hot air. According to Meredith's eldest brother, Ken Maynard, Pierce was a gunna man, always talking about what he was gonna do, but nothing ever happens gonna have his own car yard and all that sort of stuff. Before the marriage, Meredith and her siblings were mentally tortured by their alcoholic father's lifestyle, especially the youngest, Wayne, who spent his early teens in and out of mental institutions. For Meredith, marriage provided a much needed escape from the family home. Unfortunately, it turned out to be a case of moving from one difficult situation to another. The relief of witnessing her father overcome his drinking problem and reconcile with her mother quickly turned into horror in April 1985, when Wayne went on a rampage, fatally shooting both his parents. Following these tragic events, Meredith struggled even deeper with depression. In terms of character, Stuart was Meredith's opposite. An egotistical, macho figure, a former Hells Angel biker, and a small-time troublemaker since age 16. He had a record of offenses like assault, receiving stolen goods and drunk driving. In 1990, when his brother-in-law was released from a psychiatric hospital, Pierce feared he would pose a threat to the family. Consequently, he fortified their home with extra locks, two Alsatian guard dogs, and a small arsenal of guns. Neighbor George Dobbin recalled he wanted his home to be like Fort Knox. Stewart often brought bad characters home despite the presence of small children. Meredith tried to intervene, but confronting him in such situations proved futile. Stewart would assure her that his drinking buddies, potheads, and down and outs were just staying for a couple of days, only for them to end up sticking on her couch for months. A possible attraction for these freeloaders was a concrete bunker beneath the house, housing powerful UV lights and a watering system for growing marijuana. The police later discovered over three dozen marijuana plants. Awoken by a deafening roar, Tom and Marge Harris rushed outside in their dressing gowns on January 5, 2011, to witness their neighbor's home consumed by a raging inferno. Marge vividly described the horrific scene, and despite the swift arrival of emergency services, the blaze proved uncontrollable, leaving the house gutted. Though unspoken, a silent acknowledgement hung in the air. No one could have survived the engulfing inferno. The grim reality proved true as four charred bodies were delivered to the morgue. The true reasons behind the tragedy remain uncertain. Was it the aftermath of a colossal argument, or did it unfold as part of a long-term plan? On January 5th, Meredith and three of her children met a brutal end. Adam, 11, Travis, 9, and Carrie, 
two, were strangled, while the mother suffered repeated beatings with a blunt, heavy object. The bodies were strategically placed in different rooms and the house was doused with petrol. A surviving son, Paul or Matthew, the name depends on the source, could hardly be deemed lucky having lost his entire family. Yet, had he not been spending the night at a friend's house, he too would have likely perished. Pierce's surviving son, Matthew. He has lived a troubled life since the murder, which happened while he was at a friend's house. On the night before, Pierce, who had been off sick since New Year's Day, returned to work at BP service station in the nearby suburb of Wingfield. Taking over for the midnight shift, his colleague Graham Jeffrey noticed Pierce's smell of alcohol and slurred speech. Pierce confided in Jeffrey, expressing frustration with his domestic troubles. Meredith, 31, worked as a waitress at the restaurant in the service station complex. Jeffrey knew her well, but wisely refrained from getting involved in Pierce's family affairs. Once, he had advised Pierce to spend more time with his family, resulting in a physical altercation. Returning the next morning at 7.15 a.m., Jeffrey found Pierce sitting by the till, visibly burdened. Before ending his shift at 7.25 a.m., Pierce voiced his discontent once again. I've had enough, he confided to Jeffrey. I'm sick of life and I'm sick of the hassles. I think I'll sell up and live in the bush. With that, he drove off toward his home and that marked the last sighting of Pierce. If, as the police are certain, Pierce committed the horrific act of killing his family, the motive behind his snap that night remains elusive. However, during the Christmas holiday period, signs pointed to the Pierces reaching a breaking point. The tension had escalated during a fierce argument at a party as recalled by Lorraine Hasty. Upset, Meredith returned home alone and ended up having her solitary bottle of champagne with the children. Lorraine explained, when things didn't go Stuart's way, he would turn very nasty. My sister knew when to leave him alone. If Pierce is still alive and according to Lorraine Hasty, she believes he is, she is convinced he would be bragging about getting away with the murders. I remember Stuart saying he could beat the police that he could outsmart them, she revealed. Something's got to be done to capture him. Our family wants to know why this happened to Meredith and the kids. None of them deserve this. The manhunt took police to South Australia's southeast and across the border into Victoria following unconfirmed sightings that yielded very few clues. Detective Sergeant Jerry Feltis, now retired, the chief investigator, expressed doubt that the fugitive would be found alive. He speculated, I think he killed his family and then himself, but his body hasn't been found. He was reportedly last sighted in Mount Gambier in March 1996, but I'm not sure. Some of my colleagues believe he changes his appearance regularly to avoid detection. Why kill your wife and family? It's difficult to comprehend. Why kill your children? We don't know why, but I do know, unfortunately, that people do strange things to one another. Why he didn't just go to the wild and leave them be? Why spare a son if he was after all his bloodline? Could it all be a drug deal went wrong?